I'm going now to give you the, uh, the presentation for, from this year's ALNAP State of the System report. The question that I'd like to ask today is whether the humanitarian system is broken, and if it is, can we fix it? And it's a question that you may have heard before, but I'd like to address it by using the evidence from the latest ALNAP report. So please hold this question in your mind as I provide an answer to it at the end of the presentation. So the report itself is in two parts, and the first provides a description of the shape of the humanitarian system using statistics on the global caseload, organisational capacities and funding flows. And the second part of the report is an analysis of humanitarian performance using OECD DAC criteria. The methodology is based on an evaluation synthesis, key informant interviews, field studies in different crisis types, and a survey of over 1,000 aid recipients. And this methodology is the result of about 10 years thinking and experience within ALNAP, and all the detail, if you're interested, can be found on the ALNAP website. So let's start with the shape of the system and the humanitarian caseload. So we've seen fewer emergencies in the past three years, but those that have occurred have been characterised by conflict, longer duration, high levels of displacement and larger caseloads, and especially, of course, in, the, in relation to the massive human exodus from Syria into Iraq, Jordan, Lebanon and Turkey. And in addition, chronically unstable situations such as the Central African Republic, Mali and Southern Sudan experienced new outbreaks of violence. And we should also note that in 2014, the UN appeal for Syria was more than £3 billion, which was the most expensive uh, country appeal in 10 years. Now, you can see from the light blue shading on this slide that about 80% of humanitarian work takes place in countries affected by conflict. And of the 58 countries that receive humanitarian assistance in 2014, 49 of them have received it every year for the past five years, and 40 of these countries were on their 10th year of receiving humanitarian aid. Now, the absence of political and development solutions means that new conflict emergencies are added to the caseload more quickly than the older ones drop off. And the dark blue shading indicates climate disasters like Typhoon Haiyan, and region-wide epidemics such as the Ebola crisis. And both of these created surges on top of our usual long-running crisis. And this has resulted in system overload, which I'll come on to later. Now, the overall funding trend remains upwards in terms of volume and share of gross domestic product. And in 2014, the system reached its highest funding level yet of about $20 billion. But these figures show that the increased numbers of people in need of assistance has outpaced the growth in funding. So the average amount contributed per aid recipient has in fact dropped by 26% since the last days of the system period. And this graphic represents a similar point. You can see here that the dark blue represents funding requested and the light blue indicates funding received. And again, the figures demonstrate a shortfall between need and supply. And there are clear differences between funding between sectors. A particular note is that protection is very poorly funded at just 30% of stated requirements, even though most assistance is conflict related. And we know now that at the recent Red, Cross, uh, Red Crescent Conference in Geneva, states were unable to agree on a compliance mechanism for international humanitarian law and the rules of war. Now, this is important. The, the perception of sufficiency amongst practitioners has declined, dropping to a new low of 24% from 36% in 2010 and 34% in 2012. And not surprisingly, pessimism was greatest about the ability to reach people in conflict, which may reflect the sad fact that the highest number of aid worker casualties was recorded in 2013, with 151 humanitarian colleagues killed, 
171 people wounded and 134 people kidnapped. So we also see continued growth in the number of organisations and staff. As of 2013, there were about 4,500 organisations operating as humanitarian providers. The majority are local or national NGOs working inside their own countries. And agencies have also increased staff in the field by about 16% since the last report. And this is because agencies tend to take on new staff to respond to surges, but don't shed them to the same degree afterwards when the emergency has subsided. And with regard to uh, financial contributions here, a total of 61% of direct financial contributions to emergencies went to the UN, making them the single biggest recipient. And with regard to NGOs, the International Rescue Committee has now joined the five NGO giants. Now, the IRC, that's the International Rescue Committee, has tripled its spending since the last State of the System period and is the only top-tier organisation which doesn't have a structure with multiple branches. Now, direct funding for national NGOs remains very unpredictable. Donors still appear very unwilling to take risks and adjust internal financing mechanisms, as do foreign banks who are reluctant to transfer funds to Islamic charities and organisations working in the Middle East. And according to one report, local NGOs receive only 0.2% of international spending. Now, having said this, local and national NGOs do receive more money through pass-through arrangements based on longer-term partnerships but in the short term, they often find themselves in the position of acting as a subcontractor. So the funding landscape is similar to what it was seven years ago when we first started to do this report. The top three donors make up more than 50% of the total government humanitarian contributions. The, the Americans are by far the biggest, followed by the EU and DFID. However, new donors outside of the rich Western club, notably uh, Saudi, are emerging, notably Saudi Arabia, whose largest grants went to the Syrian and Iraq emergencies, and Kuwait and the United Ar Ar Arab Emirates have also joined the league table. Now, contributions from private sources only rise to significant levels in years that see high-profile, rapid-onset disasters like Typhoon Haiyan. But for the bulk of humanitarian response, private funding runs at below 10% of total. And between 6 to 8%, by the way, these things are banknotes, if anyone's wondering there. Uh, between 6 to 8% of funding flows went through the usual pooled funding instruments that we use in humanitarian assistance, the common humanitarian funds, the emergency response funds, and the global level SURF. And this single channel approach is seen by some donors as more efficient than giving multiple grants. And they see it also as, as a way of improving coordination. But the two largest donors, that's the Americans and the EU, still tend to fund recipient organisations directly. Now, that's a lot of information to take in. Uh, let's take a breath here. I'm going to summarise where, where we've got to. So what we know about the global system is that there are an increasing number of organisations delivering humanitarian assistance and overall funding has increased. But it has not kept pace with the higher caseload of affected people. The balance in donor composition remains largely the same, but self, some Gulf states are giving more funds. Protection, in particular, appears to be underfunded. We know that the bulk of the financial resources are controlled by UN agencies. There are more local and national NGOs, but big internationals still dominate. And local NGOs are perceived to be missing out. And sadly, being an aid worker is more dangerous than it ever has been. And we also know that the length and depth of conflict-related emergencies is growing and deepening, with larger number of people affected for longer periods of time. And many of those require significant protection. And uh, we know that difficulties around strengthening international humanitarian law still exist. So that information on, on growth is important, but I guess what this report is all about is how well the system is performing. And the report bases the analysis on four key humanitarian functions. 
responding to sudden onset disasters, supporting populations in chronic crisis, building resilience and independent capacity, and advocating for humanitarian access. And I'm going to take you through them quickly, one by one. So, responding to sudden onset disasters. The headline message here is that the system shows clear signs of improving. Um, Typhoon Haiyan was the only massive natural onset disaster during the review period, and the positive news is that the international system proved itself capable of timely, effective, and relevant response, and coverage was also good. And here, the strong capacity of the host government helped to make the response a success, but there were also other elements, such as the quick mobilisation of private funding, where over 20% of the responses recorded by the financial tracking services came from private sources. And 63% of Filipino aid recipients said they were satisfied with how quickly aid arrived, even though we know there were difficulties in reallocating unused relief funds in the recovery phase. And it's also heartening to note that the Philippines response was the first natural disaster in which the new transformative agenda Notably, the L3 emergency classification was tested, and overall it was seen to perform very well. Now, it wasn't all perfect, of course, uh, and there was a tendency for agencies to automatically assume that host governments can't cope. And as one official put it, the international system defaults to going in heavy with no regrets. And inevitably, this reminds us of the kinds of problems we witness after the 2005 tsunami and the Haiti earthquake. And I'll return to this uh, issue of lack of flexibility later on. Now, within this category, we can also include the 2014 Ebola earth, uh, out outbreak in West Africa, which presented a new magnitude of operational challenge. And although the early warning systems were there, the international health emergency machinery wasn't activated for nearly half a year. And in any in, uh, absence uh, of uh, standing capacity to respond, the in initial response was weak and disconnected. And it should also be noted the architecture from the transformative agenda wasn't used here. So the second one supporting populations in chronic crisis. And the headline message here is not good, and it's that humanitarian assistance is falling short in its supporting vulnerable people in conflict crisis. Coverage is really patchy, and agencies are being pulled in different directions within crisis, and increasingly stretched across crisis. There are also really serious problems with recruiting qualified staff with appropriate language skills to work in difficult conditions. Added to this, there's significant gaps in funding, as demonstrated most notably in Central African Republic and Southern Sudan, and a worrying perception that high levels of need are acceptable in ongoing crises. Now, so speaking about Somalia, one interviewee spoke of a change of perspective with, relate, with respect to baselines to the effect that if it's not famine, it's okay. Lack of access continues to be a major impediment, particularly in Central African Republic, Mali and Southern Sudan, and identifying and accessing internally displaced people has been especially difficult due to an overfocus on IDPs in camp settings. There was one positive thing, and that was the L3 designation from the UN, which helped shine a spotlight on chronic crises when they flared up into an acute phase. And this helped increase the funding to operational NGOs and staff capacity, but as I say, not, of course, to sufficient levels. Now, compounding all of these issues is the fact that humanitarians are being asked to play increasingly wider roles, supporting securitization, filling gaps left by development actors and substituting for weak or neglectful host governments. And this is largely because it's much easier to get international consensus for humanitarian assistance than really tackle the seemingly intractable, intractable security, political and economic problems. And sadly, we're reminded once again of the uh, debates sparked by the multi-donor Rwanda re evaluation nearly 20 years ago. So, independence, uh, sorry, building resilience and independent capacity. 
Now, of course, one way of addressing long-running issues of chronic poverty and vulnerabilities through building resilience, but the headline message here is that the system is struggling to make any progress. Now, one of the key issues is around the definition, and it remains very unclear to all of us working in humanitarian assistance what kind of activities resilience involves. And as one interviewee remarked, resilience is really a bucket that almost anything can fit into. Nevertheless, funding for projects with a resilience tag has gone up, reaching 5% of total humanitarian flows, with a majority going to sub-Saharan Africa. Most of this has gone to preparedness activities and less the post-crisis recovery and rehabilitation. Now, early warning systems were cited repeatedly as valuable and effective, and according to one UN official, early warning measures and government evacuations saved hundreds, if not thousands, of lives in the Philippines. And another positive change is a small number of chronic emergency contexts, Sudan and Yemen, for example, which have benefited from multi-year resilience funding. But these games are exceptional, and there is limited evidence to suggest that resilience activities have had any meaningful effect in chronic emergencies overall. So the underlying question here is to what extent humanitarian actors should be responsible for addressing these deeper problems, especially in chronic crisis. And as one interviewee in the Sahel put it, the problems are created by structural development and governance issues that we simply don't have the toolbox to fix. And ultimately, this means that we need meaningful engagement with development agencies, donor governments and international finance institutions, all of whom bring the appropriate resources and leadership. But instead, it appears we're stuck in a cycle of trying to make already overstretched humanitarian resources go even further. And finally, advocating for humanitarian action and access. Now, another way of addressing these chronic political problems is through advocacy to uphold IHL and humanitarian principles, seeking broader solution to crisis and to raise funds. The headline message here is that the system continues to struggle, particularly with regard to advocacy in chronic crisis. Now, the report does find some positives, and the UN Security Council resolution, UN Resolution 2165, is seen as a significant achievement. It resulted in more aid going to Syria, uh, it lessens the secrecy of the approach and made it possible to what has become known amongst humanitarians as the whole of Syria approach. However, this good news needs to be balanced by other disappointments, including the fact that a protection strategy for Syria was not established until June 2014, three years after the start of the conflict. And in addition, experiences again in Central African Republic and Southern Sudan point to the difficulties of securing a wide enough body of support to create sufficiently robust messages. And ultimately, advocacy on behalf of Central African Republic and Southern Sudan did not succeed in mobilising sufficient resources or fixing the problem. And overall, some organisations have invested considerably in advocacy, but global efforts are still very limited in scope. So... In summary, we're seeing improvements in response to sudden onset emergencies, that's good, but in the areas of con chronic crisis, resilience and advocacy, we've seen stagnation and decline since the previous edition. So if you're still with me, let me return to the question I posed right at the beginning. The evidence shows that the system is clearly not broken as some suggest. And in 2013, 73 million crisis-affected people were identified in, in inter-agency appeals. And many of these situations, the odds are stacked for sa failure. But nevertheless, tens of millions of people receive support paid for by international funds. And we can safely assume that millions of lives were saved. And this is a remarkable human achievement in anyone's terms. And we know that improvements are happening, including cash-based programming, programming, needs assessment, alignment with host governments, flexible funding, and communications with crisis-affected people. And all of those are mentioned in the report. But 
and it's a really, really big but. If the system isn't broken, it's really overstretched. It's underfunded, it's inflexible, and not sufficiently capable of adapting to different contexts. There are clear gaps in coverage and surge capacity, especially in chronic conflict situations where protection needs are highest and where most humanitarian work is done. And in spite of UN Resolution 2165, the system has not been able to support and enhance security and safety in conflict situations. It's been unable to fill the gaps created by weak or neglectful host governments through resilience program, programming, and questions remain whether this should be the role of humanitarians in the first place. And there's still an accountability cap, gap when it comes to listening and responding to the needs of affected people. And our survey shows that only 33% of aid recipients have been consulted on their needs. And of those 33%, only 20% said their agency had acted on the feedback to make improvements. I'm coming to the end now. I said I'd say something about how the system uh, has in, has, uh, in, could be improved. And instead of providing you with a long list of solutions, I'm going to share three simple ideas that focus on stretching the fabric of the system itself. Now, let me explain what I mean. Essentially, there are three stretch factors that the humanitarian system needs to work out. Coverage, duration, and diversity. So factor one is about coverage. Currently, resources don't stretch far enough to cover the current caseload. It's simple as that, especially in times of crisis surges. And we need better access and more understanding of the needs of different groups to make sure that people don't fall under the radar. Ultimately, we need a system directed by need and not supply. More resources and funding are required to make this stretch. And we need also new innovative ways of working. Stretch factor two, two is about duration. The caseload is changing. There's a bigger caseload. There's more displacement and longer duration. And currently, the system just isn't flexible enough. And we need to increase programming timeframes and cover more ground. And stretch factor three, finally, is about diversity. We need to be able to work with different actors in different contexts and in different types of crisis. And at the moment, the evidence strongly suggests that the system is not flexible and adaptable enough and defaults to one size all fits model. So I hope you do get the opportunity to read the report. Um, and I hope these three simple ideas around coverage duration and diversity may help the humanitarian system uh, by providing a helpful framework for, for everyone concerned with helping to make changes and improvements.